And if you want to just reach around and grab your Bibles, we're going to go ahead. I, I don't want to have you sit down and stand right back up. Uh, try to make life a little bit easier for you. Thank you, sir. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. If you want to follow along with the sermon outline, right there is the QR code that you can do that. Um, or you could just make notes wherever uh, you have that option. But this is the second week in our series entitled The Lord's Church. And so looking here, beginning in Acts chapter 2, going to begin in verse 1. The word says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there were appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man his own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you this morning because our only hope is in Jesus. But because it is in Jesus, then it is a sure, confident, and steadfast faith that he who is faithful to call us and save us will also secure us until we see him for all of eternity and we worship him with the redeemed. And Father, as we look into your word this morning, God, I'm praying that you would just get me out of your way. Father, fill me with your spirit again and speak as only you can, that your name may be glorified and that hearts would be drawn to you. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. So let me ask you now, I'm going to date myself a little bit here. How many of you remember growing up playing a game called Psych? Anybody? All right, there's a few of you. Cool. Like you would be telling a story, you get somebody all invested, go, Psych, right? Um, or, or, or you would tell them how great this soda was, and, and, and you would have the can in your hand and go, Here, why don't you try it? And then they would turn up an empty can, and you go, Psych. All right, let's just be honest. It's kind of a way to be a jerk to your friends. Right? That's, that's what that game was. Um, but whether you've ever played that game or not, my guess is everybody here, everybody watching online, you have dealt with disappointments in life, haven't you? You have had moments where you expected life to go one way, and all of a sudden, it went another way. We see this time and time and time again uh, playing out in everyday life and you know we feel let down we feel frustrated we often forget that life over promises but under delivers right that that was if you go back to the garden of eden that first temptation right there was an over promise by satan if you eat this you're going to be just like god you're going to know good from evil but it underdelivered because the moment they gave into it, guess what? Did they feel more empowered? Did, did they feel happier? They felt shame. They realized that they were naked before God. And there are probably times in life that you felt that way. That you thought, hey, let, let me just do this. It, it's going to be okay. And, and then all of a sudden you do it and you feel that shame. And you feel like everything is just laid open before God and before everybody else. 
Well, I got good news for us this, this morning because God never overpromises and underdelivers. God always promises and delivers exactly what he promised. That's why we can confidently say that there is forgiveness for that heart that will turn in faith to him. But where do we get the power from to be bold in our proclamation of the gospel? Because let's be really honest. Things in our own nation have changed very drastically in the last 30 years, haven't they? Some of you remember a time in, in which you began every school day with prayer. And now if you want a lawsuit, pray in school. Pray before a sporting event. Right? We, we see all of these seismic shifts happening. But we also, on the other hand, know that as Christians, we are called to be faithful witnesses to God. You know, honestly, we're probably a whole lot more like Peter before the crucifixion than we want to admit. What does that mean? Well, we'll get into it in just a little bit. But where does the power come from to be a faithful witness? There it is. The coming of the Holy Spirit empowered every believer to take the gospel to every nation. The key word in that phrase, uh, that statement, is the word every. Because you see it, every believer to every nation. So, 50 days after the crucifixion and resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes in power and glory. We see it here in Acts 2. So what did the coming of the Holy Spirit mean for us? It means, number one, that we can accept who Jesus is and we can trust what he says. You know, the very coming of the Holy Spirit, 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, was another proof that the disciples then and now can trust what Jesus says. Listen, if you're wondering, can I really trust God? Let me just put it this way. Everything that he has said is going to happen has happened. There's not been a single time that God has not fulfilled what he has promised. We saw, uh, as Chris read in John 14, it repeated in chapter 16 of John, that Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to send a helper and a comforter to be with you. Now, those are two promises given to God's children. Okay, that means this, that God, the Holy Spirit will help us be the men and women, be the church that we're called to be. In other words, you and I cannot do it on our own. You know, in, in the American church, we become very pragmatic. Like, we can program the life out of stuff, can't we? Like, I mean, we, we come up with all these various programs. What we really need is the power of the Holy Spirit. But not only is he our helper, but he is also our comforter. Because even as Christians, life can disappoint us, can't it? We can suffer and we can go through various things. And yet we have God himself to comfort us. The coming of the Holy Spirit was also a fulfillment of the Old Testament. We see it in verses 17 to 21 of our text there. So the coming of the Holy Spirit served God's purpose. To seal God's children. Now, starting in verse 14, and we stop just shy of it uh, in the reading. What we see is Peter's very first sermon. It covers 14 to 36. But he delivers this sermon in response to the crowd around him. Because all of a sudden, there's this big commotion. And people are hearing these Galileans. Now, you and I don't think much about that, that term, but they weren't the most educated people in the world. That's why they go, are those speaking, not, are they not all Galileans? Like, like, how are these uneducated, backwards people able to speak these languages that they hadn't heard? And yet we're hearing it perfectly. Is because the coming of the power of the Holy Spirit was speaking in them and through them. And so Peter uh, the, the crowd goes, oh, they got to be drunk. And Peter stands up and goes, no, 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 they're not drunk. Let me tell you what's happening. And that is his entire sermon. He is talking about who Jesus is. In verses 22 and 23, it says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So what we see is Peter saying, giving us two lessons. The first one there in verse 22 is this, that Jesus is a man. 
Now, we also know he is God, but that's not where the text is, so we're going to set that aside. See, Peter is saying to the crowd, you saw what Jesus did. You heard what he taught. This was an uh, audience that would have been familiar with him. Like, they, they would have seen Jesus. They, they would have heard him speak. And so Peter's just going, listen, you don't have to doubt who he is. You saw him, and you heard him for yourself. And Peter goes on to, to remind us of why Jesus came. You see, Jesus came as a sacrifice for our sin. He came, verse 23 tells us, as part of the predetermined plan of God to satisfy the Father's wrath against our sin. So Jesus came not just to be a good moral teacher, not just to give us a good example, but he came as the God-man to die in our place so that we could be forgiven of all of our sins. So that we could sing songs and live a life of my hope is in Jesus. This is who he is. And so Peter wants them to understand. We see also, it reminds us that God is with us. Think back to, to Christmas. Believe it or not, it was almost five months ago. Man, this year's flying, right? But you think back, the angel came and said, you shall call his name Emmanuel. Which means what? God with us. The very coming of Jesus proves that God was with his children to accomplish the purpose behind it all. And yet, you and I can be reminded that God is with us as well. Because Jesus dying on that cross is proof that God is with us. The Holy Spirit coming in power and glory is proof that God is with us. The testimony of the Bible is proof that God is with us. So then we get to the second lesson in verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So that second lesson that Peter wants us to see is that God is sovereign. Now what does that mean? It means that God is in control of all things at all times. Now, why is this important? Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt like life was out of control? Have you, how many of you have made a plan, and you wake up in the morning, you're ready to execute that plan, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call, a text, or an email, and instantly your day changed? You ever had those days? Why did the Jews not understand who Jesus was? Because they had a misconception of who the Savior would be. See, to the Jews, their Messiah, their Savior, he was going to come in. He was going to be a conqueror. He was a military guy. He was going to kick the Roman government out. He was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. We saw the disciples think that exact same thing last week, didn't we? That they were all about this, this military might happening. And so for the Jews, Jesus can't be the Messiah because a Messiah doesn't die. The Messiah kills, but he doesn't die. And yet Jesus came this first time not to kill, but to be killed. To give his life as a ransom for many. And so they didn't understand who Jesus was because he wasn't what they were looking for. They had their own thoughts about what a Savior should be. How often do we fall in that same trap, though? How often do we worship the God, not of the Bible, but the God that we've created in our head? I'll give you one of the ways that we do it. When we know something is sinful and we shouldn't do it, but we go, it's okay, God will forgive me. That's making God in our own image. That's making God okay with what we do. And so we have to understand who he is. Yet look at what Peter says again. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus did not die as some helpless victim but rather gave his life in full obedience to the purpose that he came. Don't make Jesus weak. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. He said, I lay it down, and watch this, I'm going to take it right back up. Why? Because life and death are in his 
control because he has all power and all authority in who he is. This is why the doctrine of sovereignty is such a comfort for me. Because even when life feels out of control, when everything just seems to be going sideways, I can remember this, that God is in control. Now, what's the message that the world wants to tell us? Right, our society wants to say that everything happens by chance or by circumstance, right? It just kind of happened. Well, if that's the case, then nobody's in control. And that's one of the most miserable messages we could ever hear, isn't it? Because if everything happens by chance and circumstance, then you and I have zero hope that tomorrow's going to be better than today. I mean, it, it maybe if all the breaks go the right way, then maybe tomorrow will be better. But if no one's in control, then we can have no hope of that. We just have to go, well, wherever the, the, the dice roll, that's where it's going to be. How many of you want to live in that world? How many of you want to live in a world where there's absolute zero certainty? But see, if God is in control and God is good, which Scripture teaches us, and he promises this, he's going to work all things out for his glory and the good of his children, then that means this, that even on the worst of days in my life, God is still in control, and therefore he's got a plan and a purpose for what's going on. And you know what? Today may be bad. Tomorrow may be worse, but one day, God's going to make it right. It's talking about learning to persevere through these difficult times in life. It gives us purpose. Because God being in control doesn't mean I understand everything. You know, most people quote Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You know what that verse doesn't say? It doesn't say all things are good. What the Apostle Paul wrote is all things work together for good. That means this, that God is even in the middle of your pain and your suffering right now. Those days of disappointment, those days when you are watching a loved one slowly pass away, God is still there. That even when your world gets turned upside down and you feel like you're at the beach and just wave after wave is hitting you and knocking you over, it means that God is there. That's what it means for God to be sovereign. Is that there's not a place, there's not a situation that God is not in the middle of working for his glory. Even if we don't understand it. Now, what's the result of this message? I mean, this was a message of hope, wasn't it? But what's the, re what's the result? Well, it's going to be the same result to this sermon and, and to every other sermon preached for all time. Some are going to receive it and some are going to be offended by it and reject it. Now, it's the same for you and I when we share the gospel. Some are going to believe and some are going to reject it. And here's where you and I have to ground ourselves in the hope. The hope and the sharing of the gospel is the promise that God said, I will save some. There's nowhere in the Bible that says God's going to save everybody. But he said, I'm going to save some. And so you know what we do? We share the gospel. And what happens if somebody doesn't respond? Don't take it personal. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. When you share the gospel and, and they don't respond, you know what you do? You pray for them. You pray that God softens their heart, softens their mind, and, and draws them to himself. You pray for another opportunity to share the gospel. The win in evangelism is not a person surrendering to Jesus. That's not the win. That's God's win. That's God's glory. The win in you and I sharing the gospel is just being faithful to be a witness to the glory of God. 
Be faithful. Trust Him to work things out. One thing that we want to better understand is this understanding of salvation. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. We know that's three of the five solas of the Reformation. But what we often don't talk about is how does a person go about responding to God's grace? Is it something they do or is it something that God does? The answer is both. But the order is important. First verse. I get it to pop up. There we go. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Can I tell you how incredible of a blessing that is right there? If a person is supposed to come to God, they will come. It's not about me being gifted and sharing the gospel. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about the grace and the goodness of God drawing the heart. But how can a person come? That's a great question. That should be what our minds go into. Listen to it. No one can come to the Father unless, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me, the Jesus. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father who sent him draws him. The only way we come to Jesus is for God to draw us first. Now, what does that mean? It means for him to open our hearts and our minds to understand that we are sinners who are in need of a Savior. That's God's sovereignty right there. That is God being good and saying, you know how many of us deserve to be saved? Let, let's just go back there. How many of us deserve God's grace to be saved? The answer, not a single one of us. God would be perfectly just because of who we are by nature and by action, to go get out of here. God would have every right to condemn us. This is what makes the, the cross so incredible, because a holy God who could have abandoned us instead left the glory of heaven to come and redeem us from us. That's the beauty of the gospel. Is that God didn't have to love us. He didn't have to save us. He chose to. That's why he says in John 15, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to, a, to go and bear fruit that will last. But here's the other side of it. You must respond. You know, the, the reality in a, in a lot of churches, especially here in the South, is you've heard this message before. You have heard the gospel. You, you have probably heard it since you were knee-high to a grasshopper. Man, that was my grandma's favorite phrase. I'm not really sure how you can be knee-high to a grasshopper, but that's cool. Right? But you've probably heard it. You've got the intellectual knowledge of who Jesus is. If I was to say to you, Jesus is God, you go, yes. Jesus is man. Yes, Jesus is the only way to be saved. Yes, you are a miserable, filthy, rotten sinner who deserves judgment. Yes. But it's never changed your life. You've got the facts. But it's never penetrated here. And it's been up on the screen for a little bit. That's the second part of the Holy Spirit coming. It is to change us. You cannot go with God and stay where you are. If you are the same person now since you are claimed to be a Christian as you were before you became a Christian, you haven't gone anywhere. The Spirit comes to change us. So we're going to do a little Old Testament work here really quickly. In the opening of the chapter, there's something really interesting that happens. There's the presence of fire on their, their tongues, right? So what does the presence of fire mean biblically? It means the presence of God. All right? Let, let me show you this. All right? It was Moses and the what type of bush? burning right fire okay when God was leading Israel out of Egypt he led them by, by cloud by day and a pillar of what by night fire 
all right? What inhabited the tabernacle and later the temple? The presence of God. So fire indicates the presence of God. Now watch what happens here. In Acts chapter 2, is that fire inhabiting the physical temple? No, it is now residing in every believer. It's what the text says. So here's the thing. The new temple of God is not a building built by hands, but rather the body of believers known as the church. So if you are here and you have been saved by grace, you possess the Holy Spirit. Every single believer, should a catastrophe happen and this building get leveled, Westlake Baptist Church would still exist because we exist. This is the importance because it used to be in the Old Testament, come and see what God is doing. But what does Jesus tell us at the end of his ministry? Does he tell us come and see? No, no, no. He says, go and tell. Why? I mean, they couldn't have just picked up the whole temple. They did the tabernacle. They couldn't pick up the whole temple and take it place to place. And so the presence of God, the temple of God is now mobile. Because God is drawing a people, and we're going to talk about this, from every nation under heaven. So on the day of Pentecost, God inhabited his people the same way he used to inhabit a building. But so what? Like, how many of you, if you were to stick out your tongue, I'm not telling you to do that, but how many of you, if you stuck out your tongue, would have fire dancing on your tongue? That'd be kind of weird, right? So how do, can we know that we have the Holy Spirit live inside of us? How can we know that we are truly a child of God? We know it the same way the people here in Acts 2 knew it. Because there was a change in them. Let's talk about Peter for a moment. 53 days before this moment. 53. Less than two months. Peter was a coward. He denied knowing Jesus. To a little girl. Three times he denied. Right? I heard one pastor put it this way. What Judas did for money, Peter did for free. They both denied Jesus. They both betrayed him. Yet now here is Peter going from a coward just two months earlier to now he is a courageous proclaimer of the gospel. How did that happen? It's not because Peter said, hey, wait a minute, I made a mistake. It was because the power of God came into his life and fundamentally changed who he was. Think about him. So Peter denies Jesus. He takes off running. He decides, you know what? It's over. I've messed up too much. He says, I'm going to go back fishing. Fact of the matter, isn't that where Jesus finds them later on after that first resurrection Sunday? They're, they're back fishing. Peter is wallowing around in his own guilt and shame going, I'm no longer useful to God. And then there's a seaside breakfast that happens, and Jesus lovingly restores Peter, and he basically says, Peter, I'm not done with you yet. I mean, what an incredible message of hope, right? Because I wonder how many people here, how many people watching have ever felt that they have just completely blown it in life? Have completely felt like, you know what? There's no way God can still love me. There's no way God can still use me. I have gone too far this time Peter was a guy that followed Jesus for three years a and he messed up time and time again man Peter was always thinking uh, speaking before he thinks and just when he thinks it's all over Jesus gives him three words feed my sheep I'm not done so, so take this message. This is a great reminder of what Paul said in Philippians 3. Forgetting those things which are behind me, I've reached forward to the things that are ahead of me. Some of you this morning, you are a slave to your past. 
You are holding on to something that happened years and years ago. You have, you can't remember why you went to the kitchen last night, but you can remember exactly what was said to you or done to you 10 years ago. In Jesus' name, lay it down. If we're going to say we're Christian, then we better live Christian. For some of you, you made choices. Maybe you're still making sinful choices right now. And you feel that conviction of the Spirit. But you've resigned yourself to the belief that even if I changed, God wouldn't use me. God wouldn't want me. For you, it's a crisis of belief in the sufficiency of Jesus. I want you to hear this. The same God who died in your place to forgive you, the same God who rose from the dead is the same God who can forgive you, restore you, and use you if you will turn from your sin now. Stop rationalizing it, stop justifying it, and go, God, you're right. I'm sorry, help me. It's time to stop playing with sharks. It's time to stop playing with fire because you're going to get burned. Do not take the presence of God for granted. Peter here, he, he has been graciously restored. Like what was there about Peter that God said, oh man, i got to have Peter on my team. Answer, not a single thing. If God wanted to use Judas, he could have used Judas. He could have been done with Peter. You ever think about that? We see the others were changed as well. They're, all of a sudden, they're, they're talking in languages they've never heard. But for you and I, we may not speak in tongues, but there are other ways that the Spirit changes us. Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. The first one is love. So let me just, I, I want you to, to allow God to do a little heart examination on you right now. From before you were saved to now, do you have a genuine love for God that is growing? Do you have a genuine love for your church family? Do you have a genuine love for the lost? And by the way, before you answer, realize this, everybody can read what you post on social media. If your thing is, well, get, you know what, that's just wrong, just get them. Praise God, God didn't get us first. Are we growing in love? Joy is the next one. Are, do you have joy? I'm not saying are you happy all the time. Life hits us. Life hurts. But do we have this joy that says it doesn't matter if everything goes right today or it all goes wrong. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine and nobody can take that gift away from me. Do you have that joy? Are you growing in that joy? Peace. Man, do you have a peace that says no matter what happens, God's in control and God is good, it's going to be okay. Patience. Oof. I want you to think patience is perseverance. Are you willing? Well, let me ask it this way. Is there anything that could happen in your life right now that would cause you to say, no, Christianity is not for me and walk away from Jesus? Will you persevere when your marriage falls apart? Will you still love Jesus if your child dies? If you lose your job? If everything that you've worked for and built your entire life around is suddenly gone and all you had was Jesus, is Jesus enough? Paul ends that list. I'm going to skip through a few of them, but he ends that list with self-control. Are you growing in self-control? Do, do you understand that when you know you shouldn't do it, well, I'm not going to do it? Too often in our culture right now, people wear uh, a badge of honor that says, well, if I think it, I'm going to say it. 
You know what that is? That's a toddler. Toddlers don't have self-control. Have you ever seen a toddler willingly share? I will go down to the nursery and let's just kind of watch it do a case study. It's not natural. Just because it runs through our head doesn't mean it needs to come out of our mouth. Growing in self-control says, you know what? But my speech should be encouraging. It should be seasoned with grace. It should encourage people. Now, does that mean that we don't have hard conversations? Didn't say that. But there's a way to have a loving, hard conversation because there's no such thing as being a jerk for Jesus. That doesn't exist. We should be changed. And one of the greatest ways that's evidence that we are changing is this. We tell others about Jesus. You want to tell others. You've got that desire. I'm not saying that you do it every time you should. I'm not saying you're really good at it. But there's this desire in you. I just want to tell people about Jesus. I want to tell them about Jesus more than I want to share my favorite team or my favorite food or restaurant or whatever else. I just got to tell them about Jesus. Is that desire there? Notice there in verse 5, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. God in his grace had brought the world to the church. Think about this. You and I can be around the world in one one thousandth of a second, can't we? You hit post on social media. Boop, it's gone. If you've ever said it or done it, go do a Google search on yourself. You might go, I don't remember doing that. Google remembers. We can be around the world just like that. And we say that we love God, but we won't walk across the street to our neighbor's house and share the gospel. We'll tell everybody on social media, hey, I had a great time on my fifth vacation in as many days. Or, man, this is such a great place to eat. But we don't leverage social media to spread the gospel. Now, it's not the most effective way, but it's a way. It's a way to be a witness. To go, this is who I am, this is what I believe, and this is why. This isn't just a Jewish message. This is a global message. God had gathered people from every nation, and he was allowing them to hear in their language the gospel. You and I have been entrusted with a special message that can change this world in a way that no Supreme Court president or Congress could ever do. You and I have the opportunity, educated and uneducated, we have the opportunity to give power and glory to Jesus Christ by sharing the one message that the world needs. The question is, will we? This shows us that God meets us where we are. None of these people went looking for God. They were going to a Jewish festival. They thought they had to do good works to be saved. And God goes, watch this. He turns the world upside down right there in, in the temple. But God, what God was doing was gathering the nations to hear the gospel. If you're here and you're a believer, you're watching online, you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that lives inside of me lives inside of you. The spirit doesn't just rest on pastors or, or teachers or deacons or, or, or some people. He's inside of every one of us. What we need to learn to have is a missional mindset. A missional mindset says everywhere I go, every person I meet is another opportunity to give glory to God by telling them the message of the gospel. Now, some of you, you may not be comfortable in doing it or know how to. Listen, let me, let me help. Let the church help equip you. It can be as simple as starting with somebody that you got a relationship with and just telling them your story. Now, you need a relationship with them, but tell them your story. 
Share what your life was like, what God has done, and what God is doing. And then trust Him to work the rest of it out. It begins by taking that next step. Being faithful where we are. Whether it's you need to surrender to Jesus this morning, whether it's you need to get baptized because you want to tell the whole world, hey, Jesus Christ has saved me. Whether God is saying you need to become a part of this body to help us become who we're supposed to be. And maybe your next step is, you know what, I just need to repent of a sin right now. I've played with it long enough. God has been gracious and merciful to me, even though he doesn't have to be. So I just want to take care of business right here, right now. Whatever it is, let's take the next step together. Will you stand with me as we're going to pray? Father, as we come before you, we're grateful that we can come to worship you. A gracious, loving Father. As hard as it is to understand, there's nothing about us that should cause you to love us. Because who we are is rebels. We want to do it our way in our time. But God, we praise you that you are a gracious God, that you have not given up. You continue to pursue us with your overwhelming amazing grace Lord I don't know where everybody stands with you this morning but you do God I believe you're calling people to repent of their sin to turn and trust in you this morning I believe that you're calling us to repent of our sin even though we're saved God there's something in our life that's not pleasing to you I believe you're calling us to lay it down this morning To plant our flag and say, I stand in the amazing grace of Jesus. I can do no other. Father, whatever you may be saying, help us to respond to you. Help us to trust you by taking that next step. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The altar is going to be open. I'll pray with you.